the idea is that this is a very large scale thing, right? I mean, and if you've ever been out, you, you've seen this, okay? So, you know, again, to be sort of representatives of the department and the industry, uh, you know, I think it's good to speak informatively a little bit about the safety of it. And, you know, the two sort of hotbed things you hear about are groundwater contamination and earthquakes. And in fact, with respect to groundwater contamination, there was a one EPA study done in Pavilion, Wyoming, that they initially said it contaminated the groundwater, then they retracted the whole report because of some, uh, some issues with a lot of issues with the data and other things. And then just last week, a paper was published from Stanford basically saying they reanalyzed the data and it did contaminate the groundwater. And so it, it's, it's still sort of up, to, up, up in the air, but uh, that's the one case, the Pavilion Wyoming case. And then other than that, there's never been a documented case uh, of contaminating the, the, the groundwater. Okay, we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about why that is. And of course, the earthquakes and due seismicity as well, okay? So, fractured fluids, we really just talked about. I mean, the slick water is 98% water. Most of the other things that end it, that other 2%, are things you'd find in your house, all right? So, I think there was a case once, uh, I think I saw like a PBS Nova deal where they, they were showing up in Pennsylvania that frac fluid chemicals were found in the drinking water. Well, I don't know how they know, because most of the things, I mean, how do they know it came from fracking? Because most of the things are under your sink. Right? So it's, it's very difficult uh, to say that, that that's true. Um, and, and, you know, the thing is, I mean, we pretty much know that we're not contaminating groundwater, because we're far away from, you know, your, your auto, the aquifers you drink from are under 500 feet depth, right? Shell plays are much deeper, like Eagle Ford Shell, at its lowest depth that where any operations occur are 4,000 feet, 4,000 feet. So at, at, at the closest, it's 3,500 feet away, and in between are ceiling regions, right? At the deepest, it's 14,500 feet away, okay? And of course, if it's, you know, if, 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 if the frac fluids could migrate to the drinking water, well, the drinking water could migrate to the reservoir. And, you know, the first thing that's always done, if you've all taken drilling, you drill down past the drinking water, freshwater aquifers, and you set casing and you submit to the surface, right? No government regulator enforced that. Companies started doing that on their own. Why? No. That's not why they started. Maybe now, but the first, when they first started doing that, that's not why they did it. They did it because they didn't want the drinking water in the reservoir fluid. Nobody has any interest in having drinking water in the reservoir fluid because you've got to take it out to sell it. It's more work, right? Nobody has any interest in having water in the fluid, more water. There's already water, right? More water in the fluid, right? So, so when they first started doing surface casing, it was to protect this reservoir from the water, not vice versa, right? Uh, so anyway, um, you know, the point here is that, you know, we know from microseismic measurements at least how far the fractures grow, we can contain them from diagnostic measurements, and they are very, very far from any drinking water, okay? They, they do not extend into drinking water. And this is, you know, a lot in Pennsylvania, the Marcella Shell, because a lot of the stink is made. This is where those chemicals were found. And, you know, we have NAP fracture treatments for thousands of wells there. So these are the depths of the freshwater aquifer, and these are where the fractures were. And there's thousands of feet, even in the closest in the closest, there's thousands of feet difference. It, it could. You're, you're certainly right. Uh, that is not it's associated with hydraulic fracturing. Right. That's associated with every single well you drill, right? And so I want to confine this discussion to the discussion of hydraulic fracturing operations, producing fractures with water in the rock, right? So yes, there's always issues with wellbore integrity, but those issues or even there in conventional reservoirs, right? It has nothing to do with hydraulic fracture. Okay? Does it produce earthquakes? What's the answer? Yes, of course. That's what microseismic measurements are, right? So microseismic measurements, I'll show you a plot on the next. Basically, the idea is that we can drill offset wells or put geophones in offset wells or sometimes even at the surface, and we can sense the microseismics or the tiny little earthquakes that are associated with when you propagate a hydraulic fracture, 
there are natural fractures in the rock that are stable, and the stress, the, the stress, um, the stress redistributions caused by propagating a hydraulic fracture can cause those natural fractures to slip. And when they slip, they produce a tiny little earthquake, and you can hear it on the geophone. And this is a very, we use it for a diagnostic tool to try to understand where the hydraulic fractures are going, right? But can you feel them at the surface? Again, let's confine our discussion to hydraulic fracture. Can you feel it at the surface? No. These are moment magnitude plots from microseismics. These are it's sort of like the moment magnitude is sort of like a Richter scale, right? So to give you a point of reference, these are all negative. And I just said one more minute, I'll be done. One more minute. So these are all negative values. To give you a point of reference, a three would be the smallest thing you could feel at the surface. And this is like a Richter scale. It's a log scale. So, so the largest here is a zero. Okay. So a three is at three times larger than that. It's 30,000 times larger than that. So this, the largest thing sensed is 30,000 times smaller than the smallest thing you could feel at the surface. Again, these were produced during the hydraulic fracture. Okay. Now, the earthquakes in Oklahoma are associated with produce water, okay? But let me let you in on a little secret. Yeah, the hydraulic fracturing operations do add to it, but most of that water in Oklahoma, that they're, you know, they're, they're basically, just like we learned in this class, they're increasing the pore pressure in the reservoir by injecting fluid water, and the, these faults, existing faults are slipping, right? But they have nothing to do with hydraulic fracturing. Most of that produced water has nothing to do with hydraulic fracturing. Those are conventional plays at their water flow. And they have super high water cuts, like 95% water that they're producing. And the, the, the reason it's occurring lately is because of high oil prices lately, right? So that's why you've seen an increase over the last few years is because they turn on the water flood activities in those conventional plays. And they have a few injection wells in small regions, right? So, uh, and they're just injecting too much water. Now, yeah, I'm not going to deny hydraulic fracture operations do add to that. But, but, uh, it's, it's a lot due to the conventional water flooding that's happening as well. So there's things we can do. I mean, uh, so the earthquakes are mostly, you know, I, I don't think, I don't want to discount it's not a problem. If you live there and your house is shaking, it's a problem, right? Um, but there are things we can do to alleviate that. We have more injection wells. We can recycle the water. We can do a lot of, you know, other things. But it's not associated with producing the hydraulic fractures. Okay, I'll stop there.